What's going on, everybody? Welcome into the Monday, June 10th, 2024 edition of the Daily Energy News Beat Stand Up. Here are today's top headlines. First up, New Zealand to lift oil drilling ban amid blackout fears in blow to Starmer. Absolutely unbelievable. Next up, we'll go down to Latin America. Um, Colombia risks economic slowdown amid natural gas shortage. Not good. Next up, price of green is going higher. Absolutely unbelievable. Um, the wow. It Whoa. To actually Say it isn't so. I know. Exactly. <laughs> Say it isn't so. Uh you know, a, a blast from the past, folks. Our next article, Aircott says Texas could be facing rolling blackouts in August as Houston officials announce cooling centers. Oh, no, folks, we're back. I'm already dying here. I can't have this happen again. And then finally, out of Virginia, ignore California. Let Virginians drive what they want to drive. Stu will then toss it over to me. I will quickly cover what happened in the oil and gas markets on Friday, specifically talking about oil in relation to U.S. interest rate cuts. We do see, um, and then we did see a little bit of an SPR um, um repurchase agreement come up as uh, prices have dipped a little bit. So we'll dive into all that and a bag of chips, folks. As always, I am Michael Tanner, joined by Stuart Turley. Where do you want to begin? Hey, let's start with our buddies out there in New Zealand. But this has got one. This came out of the Telegraph, Michael. New Zealand to uh, lift oil ban amid blackout fears. And it's a blow to Starmer up in England. Policy reversal is a blow to labor's plan for similar crackdown in the North Sea. The North Sea uh, just had, and Norway had a major natural gas shutdown, and it spiked electricity prices for the EU, I mean, for the UK. So, New Zealand, out of this story, New Zealand was on Saturday night expected to revoke a ban for drilling and oil and gas amid fears of blackouts um, as the labor plans in the UK are a similar crackdown in the North Sea. The North Sea is is really got some history on that. Uh, New Zealand faces an energy shortage which threatens our electrical system and the competitiveness of our exporters we now urgently need to attract further investment and in exploration and production to keep the lights on our houses warm and businesses <laughs> it's amazing what happens that chart in their north sea decline when you compare look at this uh miss producer if you could bring that up that chart 20 to 21 um 20 to 23 and then you take a look at the forecast, it is declining. What I see is also a loss of tax revenue that these chowderheads are not figuring out. Oh, wait a minute. Loss of, of low-cost energy, loss of tax revenue equals skyrocketing energy prices. Yeah, I mean, and, and to focus specifically on what's going on in, in New Zealand, this is a country that as of 2018 only imported about 17 or only produced about 17 percent of its overall oil and gas needs. So they critically need access, one, to local domestic drilling, which they banned right. it in, um, was it 2021? Is that yeah. the year that they banned it? No, 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 yes. no. 2018, no, no. they banned it. Um, and that was under a previous uh, regime um, mm -hmm. that, that 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 prime minister was voted out, actually, in early 2023. A new right wing coalition came in. So that's one of the reasons the wheels are turning to change it. But I mean, you have to. And, and it's not even about oil. It's about yeah. natural gas. It, you know, at, at some point, it doesn't matter how it to, natural gas prices are because you've got to go out and get energy to be able to supply your grid. You either get it from elsewhere, which can be extremely expensive, and that premium relative to where you're going to purchase it on top of the cost it would, uh, it you know, the producer's going to need in order to just at least get their money back, maybe less than the fact that even though you might make, you might not make that much money on it, you're going to make more profit margin relative to producing yourself relative to importing it. So I think it's a really interesting shell game you have going on here, um, specifically in New Zealand. I mean, they have a lot of gas there. It's They have a decent amount of gas there. They're, they got about 2.2 uh, or 2.1, um, you know, 
gosh, I don't even know, PJ, I think it's what, Pentajoules? I don't even know what that terminology is. I'm just reading off Wikipedia here. They got a lot of they got a lot of remaining gas they could go get out there. So good for New Zealand to dive back in. It just goes to show you that um a lot of these a lot of these decisions that are being made are getting reversed quickly as people starting actually read the data. I mean, we, we all like to joke that everybody's stupid. Everybody is not stupid when there's a gun to their head. And I'm not and, and the proverbial gun to your head is lights are going to be turned off. You're going to have no power. That is the proverbial gun to your the, head. The, what if, the people are waking up, Michael, to the deindustrialization of the Green New Deal. The Green New Deal equals deindustrialization. Yeah, the Green New Deal did not happen in New Zealand, but there the, well, yeah, people yes, are realizing Michael, is that Michael, yes, it did. If you take a look at another article that was posted out on this, the the uh, other article was New Zealand's party, uh, the government the said uh, they stopped it in in 2018 under then leader Joaquin Ardern, but continued to allow other ones so they could bolster their renewable uh, energy. So, yeah, absolutely. yes, the, the Green New Deal, though, specifically relates to what's what happened in the United States. It's happening all around the world. Just depending it's on what a generic you term it. now. The Green New Deal, the Greens and the Greens in the party. I was referring to a green. People are referring to it the Green New Deal around the world, Michael. I'm not sure why. So, let's go to Colombia. Colombia risks economic uh, sl showdown slowdown amid natural gas storage. This is a follow along on this. Uh, Colombia's economy could s soon be hit by soaring energy costs as South America country is considering LNG imports to meet their matching, rising, matching uh, natural gas demand while its domestic production slumps. Uh, this is really critical because with no natural gas, what happens? deindustrialization de occurs. And so this is a very good eye awakening here uh, for our partners. And another thing of what, why the LNG ban for uh, the Biden administration really means to our uh, partners, we would be able to step in and help Colombia and say, Hey, we will supply you your LNG, but I wouldn't trust the U S Colombia was also not planning on importing natural gas from Venezuela, but May plans may not materialize because of the uh, decayed idle pipeline and needed repairs. Venezuela may not be able to supply it. Yeah, I think that's the most important part of all this is technically South, the, you know, South America has the has the ability to be energy independent as a continent, specifically because they have, you know, you're talking about Venezuela, the Brazilian reserves. We're talking about what's coming out of Guyana, Surama. Right. I mean, there is enough energy in that continent to be able to self supply their stuff. The problem is if you can't transport it efficiently, it, it doesn't matter. You're just it, it's it's almost like. The, the electrical grid it doesn't matter how much wind power or solar power you have in, in oh, arizona exactly you can't transport it to exactly where it's needed to aka you know the northeast you're going to be in absolute trouble so i think this shows a great example of it's a it's an entire vertical chain of exactly things that need to happen it's not just finding the gas it's finding the pipelines it's finding the export it's the export terminals and, and it's the whole nine yards in order to create a legitimate energy infrastructure. And I think Colombia is Colombia is going to learn real quick that, you know, it's not again, it's not just about LNG. It's about how do we get it there? How do we source it? Oh, yeah. And the machine has been already built in the U.S. It's just like, you know, let's time to ring that cash register and sell it to all of our our good people around the world. And. I'm trying to get together an article, Michael, because LNG reduces uh, uh, emissions. Mm -hmm. I mean, it really does. We just got to get get the word out there. Hey, let's yeah, go to the next price. The article here. I found this one just really, really good. Um, the price of green is going high. There are five key bullet points to this one, and when you sit back and take a look at the article. Uh, Michael, first one, people around the world are beginning to uh, object to the increasingly expensive cost of the energy transition being forced on them by their government. 
in businesses. Number two, a paper by the Climate Policy in, uh, Initiative, the CPI, advocates for much heftier expenses for consumers by recommending a seven-fold increase in money spent on programs to achieve UN goals reaching $9 trillion annually by 2030. Annually, we can't, the world can't afford that and increasing after that. CPI is an international group with an initial funding from George Soros that advocates for aggressive climate actions. Number four, Europe has already begun to deindustrialize, and with Germany leading the way as they want to retreat from some of their costliest plans under public pressure. Number five, States in the United States, such as California, have led the green initiatives are also beginning to push back on some green policies. We're seeing that in the next article, in with the, our last article from Virginia. <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, clearly, I mean, again, let's go back to this, the climate policy initiative. They think that we need to go from one point three trillion of funding to nine trillion. I mean, that's just a redistribution. That's just a redistribution of wealth. And whether or not that number is true or not, the question is, can we actually do that? And if we spent nine trillion dollars, would we be what better off you? than we are now? See, that's right. The thing. I, I think what people you don't understand is there's always a there's always an opportunity cost we, you know i'm an economist right. so i think of i think of these things all the time if i'm going to do x what's the opportunity cost of not doing y and if the opportunity cost is less we'll go do x in this case if the opportunity cost of not moving to renewables is less than the opportunity cost of moving to right. renewables you 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 might as well do it the problem is they look at a small sliver and they're using this word, and I'm using quotes for our podcast listeners, climate science to make this argument that the opportunity cost is way more than it is way more. When if you actually look at, if you take into account other things like the economy, people's well-being, all this other stuff, and you group it all into more of a meta-analysis, I mean, the answer becomes a lot more muddied than just, oh, we're going to save the exactly. world from, from two degrees. Yeah. So it's it's the second, third, fourth order effects. I mean, when they throw these big nine trillion, ten trillion numbers right. out, the first thing I think of, well, they're, they're just trying to redistribute the wealth from one group of, I mean, at the end of the day, it's redistributing wealth from one group of rich people to another group of rich people. So I'm not concerned for either one of them per se, but it is interesting how I, right. at the core of what they're mm -hmm. trying to do, it's trying to get the people they like the money and not the people they don't like. Exactly. Here's here's a paragraph in here that is right above the conclusion, Michael. Illinois, which is requiring 50% of its re electricity be renewable by 2030, had its power regulator reject grid improvement plans from two utilities stating the state's household should not be unfairly asked to shoulder undue costs uh, tied to the state's energy transition. The CEO of one of those Illinois uh, utilities Exxon protested because the requirements is going to cost money. The question is who's going to pay if the state does not utilities could go out of business, thereby transmitting no power to residents who expect lights on 24 by seven. It's a complicated problem. It's extremely complicated. All right. What's next? Let's go to ERCOT. Speaking of oh, complicated, great. our buddies over at ERCOT say Texas could face rolling blackouts in August as Houston officials announce cooling centers. You always got to love it. Uh, ERCOT, um, demand energy could be dangerously approached states' total electrical supply this summer, leading to a 16% chance of electric grid emergency and a 12% of rolling blackouts in August. Uh, from the Energy Reliability Council of, of Texas. Yeah, I mean, this just, I'm already dying right now. It's, you know, I mean, well, it, 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 it woke up this morning and it was already like 120 <laughs> degrees here. So the fact that now all of a sudden they're saying, hey, we may or may not have rolling blackouts. Just, just. You're like, shoot me. Yeah, exactly. Up. Shoot me. I'm going to go need to buy some. And again, this comes back to, you know, you know. If you if we if you had a reliable grid, you actually could implement some sort of battery backups for a lot of these 
in places that really need it because we do have a lot of excess energy. The problem is the energy is set up to supply on-demand energy. It's not necessarily set up to demand and supply right. energy from peaks and, 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 and the valleys. So I think that w when people talk about the grid and the grid reliability, it's stuff like this that we need to uh, – move. I mean, the, the chance that it's a 16% chance of an electrical grid emergency and 12% chance of rolling blackouts is, is pretty unbelievable. Now, the Electric Reliability Council of Texas, that is a lobbying firm for you know the other side of the equation. So they may have a right. little bit of, you know, it's like me writing an article about why oil and gas is great. But I'm a little biased. I think oil and gas is great. So right. I'm going to have a hard time being maybe 100% objective. But there, it, it, the fact that they are raising that alarm a little bit does show you that they're seeing a little, there's something in the data that they're seeing i i agree um and but you know you sit back and kind of take everything with a grain of salt anymore i trust no data unless yeah. i fabricate it myself uh <laughs> unless you <fabricate laughs> ignore california <laughs> let's go to the next what's one. next <laughs> ignore california let virginians drive what they want to drive i gotta hand it to governor glenn youngkin as he gives his state of the commonwealth address i i tell you what california policies on electric vehicles are exacerbating blackouts and restricting the restricting the ability of its residents to buy the cars they want Virginia's like gasoline powers. They like 99.9% .9 of their vehicles, 99.39% of their vehicles are ice cars. <laughs> if California wants to drive its state into an economic ditch with a senseless ban on gasoline power, but let so be it, but let's let Virginia time to be Virginia to stop riding shotgun. Go governor Yunkin. Yeah, it, I mean, it, it's it's really hard to add any other commentary on the fact that, you know, you got to let individual states do what they want to do. California can go and do whatever they want and can deal with the outcomes of their don't force your dumb policies on other states. There's just 17 states that have laws on their books that say if California passes something stupid, that bypasses them right to, to the head of the line of stupid. They can just ditto whatever california does these are the dumbest laws i have ever seen in my books it's the california stupid law mm -hmm. and there's 17 states that can do the california stupid duplicatory yeah i don't get it <laughs> <laughs> so my hats we got to give governor young a uh, shout out i'll reach out to him and get him on a podcast yeah absolutely um well we'll go ahead and uh, talk a little bit about oil and gas prices. But before we do that, we need to pay the bills. As always, guys, thank you for checking out EnergyNewsBeat.com, the uh, the world's greatest website. Stu and the team do a tremendous job making sure that website stays up to speed. Everything you need to know to be the tip of the spear when it comes to the energy and the oil and gas business. Um, you can hit the description below in the podcast for links to all of the timestamps there. 50% accurate. Um, you can have all the links to the articles and uh, you can also check us out dashboard.energynewsbeat.com. We have some really interesting stuff we're about to announce here. Stay uh, soon. Uh, some some really great educational uh, series that we're going to be putting out in partnership with, uh, with, with, with a great oil and gas company. So we're, we'll look out and be on the lookout for that as it comes down the pike. But as always, guys, just check us out www.energynewsbeat.com. Dot com. I mean, I think when we look at the overall markets due on Friday, they were fairly muted. We actually had a fairly decent jobs report. I mean, this is what's funny. So, I mean, you can you can agree or uh, not agree with the data, but the data that was presented to us showed non -par, non farm payroll increases, which means jobs created was up about two hundred um, and seventy two thousand um, for the month of May, and that was much higher than whatever Wall Street thought, which was about one hundred and ninety thousand jobs, and well above the gain of about one hundred and sixty five thousand jobs that happened um, in April. We also saw one point four or four point one percent um, of hourly earnings increase over the past 12 months more than expected great news you'd think right yay we're getting new jobs whether or not you believe those numbers or not but hey the market if 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 the if the numbers are legit i believe they are Stu doesn't he's shaking his head but let's just for let's take the they take the number at face value 
Well, why why did markets then drop? We saw the S and P five hundred down a tenth of a percentage point. We saw Nasdaq down a tenth of a percentage point. Well, unfortunately, it probably means that the Fed is going to hold off on any interest rate cuts. And interest rate cuts, theoretically, are going to lead to more movement of money. Movement of more money means you might see an increase of demand. And unfortunately, demand is one of the big things pulling down oil prices, getting to what happened on uh Friday specifically, we did see crude oil open a little bit above $76. We sent trailer down, closed at about $75.53, and we'll open probably a little bit here as, as, as the market opens here in a little bit. We'll open a little bit um, below that $75.50 uh, mark, probably $75.38 as you're listening to this when, or a Monday morning. You know, we'll, we'll probably still be below that below that seventy five mark. So it's super interesting as we see as the interest rate as, as the interest rate theory goes. So will oil prices? We also did see a huge spike in natural gas prices, all the way up to um, two dollars and ninety three cents. Um, again, as the hotter, you know, the, going back to that ERCOT um, article that we talked about, one of the reasons why they're saying demand or we might have rolling blackouts is because of the insane heat we might see this this summer specifically in the US south that's what's driving natural gas prices again $2.91 that is specific that, that i mean think considering where we came from Stu, it's pretty unbelievable we also did see rig counts drop miss producer if you can go ahead and drop this um on the screen i mean i continue to be uh not shocked but i continue to find myself on the wrong side of this analysis piece us rigs drop not drop six rigs week over week below now 600 at 594 canada picked up 15 rigs internationally they dropped 25 rigs um we're down 101 rigs from where we were last year so companies continue in the united states to drop rigs they continue to keep their uh you know keep their locations available whether or not to drill now or in the uh not to drill now but in the future so you know something that i specifically kind of swung and missed at was the idea that rig counts were going to continue to go up as we saw a stabilization of oil prices above that 70 mark but i also think you're seeing what i think a lot of people internally at these oil companies are seeing is 70 is you know 75 is you know the new you know the new 60 65 and at 60 dollar oil it, it's tough to make money. I mean, when you talk about a fifteen, you know, a three mile lateral at fifteen million dollars, you're gonna have a. It's it's an interesting underwrite prop proposition. You know, I mean that right. that that number used to be eleven, twelve million dollars just a couple of years ago, and that those numbers made sense. There's enough margin in there, but now when you're pushing that fifteen million dollar mark or thirteen and a half to fifteen million mark for a three mile lateral, depending on what type of completion job you want. You're gonna you're squeezing out a lot of the margin that was in there, and when people say go, you know, to, when people talk about pushing that, the the pushing the lateral length, the question is, what is that increase of capital relative to the increase in the amount of oil you're gonna produce? Generally, it's been the reason why you go drill longer laterals is because you're all, you know, the incremental cost of going from two miles to three miles is a lot less than the incremental gain that you're going to have of uh, the amount of oil. I mean, if you're talking, you've got a thousand barrels per foot, you can very quickly do the math. And if you're, you know, if, if, if you're, CapEx is only going to increase by 5% by going that extra mile because the rig's already out there. You're already paying for the people. You just got to keep it going and then pull it out. The theory has always been we'll just go longer and longer the better. The real question is as prices skyrocket up and the quality of the rock goes down, if the, if you're not drilling tier one acreage, the question is in your tier two, tier three, does that same relationship hold up? I think you're going to see a lot of interesting stuff come out about that, and and we'll be watching that closely. The only other thing I wanted to talk about, Stu, was uh, the U.S. speeds up purchasing um, for the Strategic Petroleum Reserve as oil prices dip. I want to get your thoughts on this. Uh, the uh, you know the Biden administration said on Friday, and I'm reading now straight from the article, has increased its purchasing of crude oil to replenish the Strategic Petroleum Reserve following its sale of uh, in 2022. The Department of Energy said on Friday that it issued two solicitations to buy a combined a whole whopping 6 million barrels of crude oil for its delivery to its Bayou Choctaw site in Louisiana um, from September through December. Um, 
you know, it's it's basically increasing their rate of purchasing per month from three to four point five million barrels per month. Um, again, which will add about six million barrels. Um, Secretary Granholm is- said in an exclusive interview on Tuesday that the department may speed up the replenishment of the SBR this year, and on Friday they made good on that deal. Her quote: "All four sites will be back up by the end of this year, so one could imagine the pace would pick up depending on the market." So they're at least dipping in and, and filling up the SBR. It's almost like taking a a a, 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 a you know a, taking a you know, taking a, a coffee cup full of water and dumping it in the ocean and saying, hey, look, we're refilling it. Exactly. Uh, Trump filled it at twenty four dollars. Uh, they sold it at ninety four. They're buying it back at seventy five They're But they're only buying less than one percent of what they sold in order to fraudulently impact the market for an election. Yeah, I'm still waiting. Yeah, I mean, I numbers matter. Yeah, I mean, you, you, you. On the other hand, you could argue that buying oil for the strategic petroleum reserve does not help prices. It actually drives prices up a little bit because there's you're taking oil off the well, market. When you're not buying less than one percent of it, it doesn't. It's not going to impact yeah, that the, much. The market's it. not being moved on this. Um, no. You know, we'll hammer the administration where we can hammer them. You know, you you can at least give them props in this standpoint that they're 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 doing a they're they're, they're refilling it. You know, and they're being fiscal. It's, they're it's, being. But I'm I'm also afraid of, and I don't know the numbers on this, but the amount that they have you left unfilled for the amount of time in the salt domes. I don't know how much we will be able to replenish in there and still have it usable. I have to go do some research on this because some of the tanks are not even able able to be used again. Well, you're going to need to do some research on that, but I I don't know. You can't let them sit there. Empty. No, you can't. But we'll uh, we'll take the win and take the extra oil in the SPR. Uh, hopefully, we'll see prices rebound a little bit from there. But 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 it can be assumed that we're going to see some interesting shenanigans as we get closer and closer to the election. <laughs> um, well, Michael, two weeks ago they just closed the entire gasoline strategic thing. They didn't just sell all of it; they closed it, and then they sold. I mean, they sold everything. So, well, I mean, again, they're 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 looking. They're very much looking to to calm the energy markets relative to this election who wouldn't if they were in their position you know trump would be doing the same thing every president has done the same thing coming up to a re-election not campaign. to the extreme i know i know with, not, i know I'm they've done no wrong slide. you're right you're right you're right what uh, what should people be worried about this week well i'll tell you what um it should be pretty uh interesting coming around the corner watch out next week this week for uh in the next few weeks for the Five hundred and seven billion dollars that may be coming uh, fiscally problems for banks. Banks are now really under scrutiny. There's seventy four that are really in trouble. Uh, I reached out to Thomas Congressman Thomas Massey to try to get him on the podcast, and I'll reach out to Governor Yonkin get him on the podcast. Love talking to folks about energy. Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, we hope you guys have a great week. It should be a pretty Pretty wild one. We'll, we'll we'll look, and we will be with you this entire week to keep you up to speed with everything going on in the energy and oil and gas business. But with that, guys, we're going to let you get out of here, get back to work. For Stuart Turley, I'm Michael Tanner. We'll see you tomorrow, folks.